Hi, I'm Kat Rosenfield. And I'm Phoebe Maltzbovi, and we are Feminine Chaos. And you can, I believe it is an RSS feed, listen to us on audio, and and soon you will be able to, what else? Support us on Patreon. Or Patreon. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> <I think laughs> I know. We'll never be able to agree on this. Um, yes, there will be some extra paid content, beginning with some extra um, video content, yeah. similar bonus, to what you're seeing now. Bonus, bonus video casts, just like this one, more or less, mm-hmm. um, but for paid subscribers only. So mm-hmm. um, if you want to get a hold of some extra, extra chaotic chaos, you should join us. Um, yes, yes, we're we're still a bit a bit work in progress, but it's it's getting there, and um, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, show um, your appreciation for all of the hard work we put into having these conversations. I bet our pets put into making their occasional cameos. Um, Winston is the, he's he's yelling in poodle that you should support us on Patreon. Absolutely. So um, um, hopefully he's going to stop doing that shortly. And in the meantime, Phoebe, what are we talking about today? Okay, so we're going to start with the, it's kind of a, um, well, everything today has a little bit of a common theme for once, um, which is the weird sort of convergence between sort of call-outs and sort of social justice criticism and possibly sort of professional jealousy. And this is a topic I've long found kind of fascinating where like it's, it's socially unacceptable and perhaps rightly so to say, isn't it unfair that this other person is doing so well professionally, whereas here I am not doing as well professionally. That's understandably considered either rude or sort of like unappealing because you're sort of showing that you're not that successful, but you know, but, but what people have sort of found as a way to kind of get around that is to say that it's really problematic that this other person who fits whichever privilege categories um, has done well, whereas even if I too fit those privilege categories, some other people don't and they haven't had those successes. This came up ages ago with the teen, now adult, um, sort of wonderkind Wunderkin, I don't know, Tavi Gevinson. Um, Mm -hmm. It came up, obviously, with everybody's favorite um, celebrity, Lena Dunham. But then it came up recently with a Medium post um, by the author Heather Demetrios about um, the publishing industry and how... um, Basically how, and it kept, it's this post that kind of has this refrain, nobody told me, nobody told me. And it's about how she grew up poor um, on food stamps. She then made a ton of money by publishing standards with some novels she wrote. And then they didn't do great. And then she realized that what seems like a ton of money when it's over years and not sort of renewable um, is actually not a ton of money. This is something I think it's very common for um, writers to kind of discover for themselves. Um, There's a great essay by Emily Gould um, about something very similar, a very similar experience from a few years ago that um, I still think about because it was really um, well-written. Um, But yeah, so anyway, that essay got called out for privilege because sure, this woman um, grew up very poor and then later didn't have any money, but there are people who have it worse than she does in this world. Right. There was this undercurrent there actually of, you know, you have white, cis, able-bodied privilege, et cetera. How could you mess this up so badly? You know, yes. like how could you, how could you screw your life up um, when you were already born on third base in so many ways? Yes. Yes. And I think that, um, there is an onion article that I quote in my book. So it's from, well, obviously since books from a while ago now, the onion article, goodness knows when it's from, but something like man squanders white male privilege working at the Best Buy. (laughs) And it's like, and it's great because it's like, 
is he actually doing, is he squandering something or is the point that in fact, plenty of white men work at the Best Buy and it's not actually strange. Um, and that just having certain very, very population level advantages does not mean that your life leads effortlessly to CEO world. Right. Whatever that well, is. But there are so many um, essays and, and articles that kind of currently fit into this trend. And I feel like we want to talk about all of them. It's true. It's true. Um, we, do. So, we do. But we can't. <laughs> not all in one podcast. Um, I'm wondering if we want to talk about, you know, the publishing aspect of things. Um, mm. You know, the, 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 the women, and it, it does seem like it's always women um, who are getting kind of targeted in these takedown pieces where is it just that they've squandered their privilege? Is it professional jealousy? Is it, you know, what, what exactly is mm. going on? Well, I think it's hard to know because I don't, I, I want to be clear that I don't think the only thing going on is jealousy. I think there often are in the mix and it's the problem is it's hard to disentangle because there are valid critiques of who does and doesn't get published. And, um, you know, I think it, yeah, it's, it's true. It wouldn't, the fact that somebody grew up poor wouldn't negate the fact that they, if in the publishing industry, if they would be advantaged for being white, it wouldn't necessarily, you know, I mean, obviously class would also enter into it, but it wouldn't necessarily mean that race doesn't, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think it's that these critiques themselves can't be valid. I think it's just that it's very hard to tell because it's impossible to say this person seems not that talented and has gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars for writing what I consider dribble, I'd not be saying like the, you know, because that is not possible. The only framing possible is this kind of social justice framing, which makes it very hard to sort of figure out what you're even looking at, which, yes. um, well, yeah. you know, what's interesting, um, is that, you know, there's never really the step back to say, you know, the vast majority, like 99.9% .9 of people never get these opportunities, you know, whatever color they are. And like the, the unfairness of it um, is kind of built in, you know, it's just something that very, very few people get to do, whether it's to become a, you know, a sort of a, a public intellectual political figure or to publish a book or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I think, I wonder also how much of it comes from people who for whom these things are just like very, very remote and how much comes from people for whom they are not remote at all and who are intimately familiar with what it means to publish a book. Yeah. And that much more shocked by like a huge advance. And I want to put a pin in I, that I, for when we talk a little bit later about the Vogue profile of Rihanna. Yes, but yes. Well, that, that might be kind of the other end of the spectrum because the first one we're going to talk about, are we, are we ready for the first one? Yeah, I mean, after Heather Demetrios, yeah. um, we also, you know... The, the second first one. <laughs> Never mind. Yes. Yes. The um, So we've talked about a Saatchi cool takedown of Kathleen Hale and BuzzFeed. Well, profile, but a, a very critical profile. And the same author, the same BuzzFeed writer has also written somewhat notoriously these days about how the sitcom Friends is problematic which I don't mind that because Friends, I think, is a terrible show, not because of problematic, but because it's just atrocious and I can't sit through it. But more recently, um, she wrote a piece, and we're going to talk about this one, about a profile of Lauren Duca, the writer known, a Teen Vogue writer um, with a new book out. Lauren Duca is known for having gone on Tucker Carlson's show um, and defended writing about both knee high, thigh high, neck high, some sort of boots. <laughs> neck high. Why not? You I'm know, sorry. Are yes. all neck high on <laughs> boots? So I, I say neck high boots. Um, and also being interested in politics and passionate and activist and such. And. She called him a sexist pig, too, which was mm. apparently an iconic moment that I missed uh, the first time around. But having watched the video, it was indeed pretty enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think it, was, it was a fun moment, a fun clip. 
And she also famously wrote for Teen Vogue about how President Trump is gaslighting America. And this is, she's very much like of the sort of women's march zeitgeist of feminism post election. And she's also, um, very much sort of like the, the personified version of the Teen Vogue moment in a way where Teen Vogue has kind of, this is something we're going to talk about as well, where these sort of fashion-y publications have kind of reinvented themselves or, or half reinvented themselves as um, social justice think piece purveyors. Yes. Um, we should probably also mention that Lauren Duca is, she's sort of like the, like right in the zeitgeist of millennial feminism. I think she's 28. Yeah. Um, oh, I she's, thought she was even younger than that, but. Um, I think she's 28 now. Hmm. I, I could, oh, that could I, be. That I makes could, sense. That I makes sense. I could possibly find a way to Google this I have, completely. I have the article about her open in a tab, and maybe it even has her age in it somewhere. Um, Duca age. Um, 28. Yep. She was born in 91. Okay. Oh, huh. Which makes It's like her. Taylor Swift, somebody where you assume they're forever, like, you know, 20, but they're they yes. always yeah. be. I mean, the problem yeah. is that, you know, having to realize that Taylor Swift is not 19 anymore means also having to realize that I myself am not like 30 anymore. And, you know, oh, the unstoppable march of time. It's a but terrible the good, thing. But the good news is that Harry Styles is like well into his mid 20s. And hence no longer illegal to lust after. Well, not, it's not, he was not illegal to lust after, but he, it just seems a little strange when he was like, 20 but yeah he's he's 25 or something now but that's that's its own topic how old Harry <laughs> Styles is which could be a full podcast but more to the point this article we're gonna save that one for the bonus material definite Just definite full, bonus full material. hour of Phoebe lusting after Harry Styles I mean <laughs> why yeah. not why not why I would not? watch I, that who wouldn't um but would anyone pay to watch that is the question probably mm. not but the point is that in this article, so the the whole profile was, it's not just that Lauren Duca has a book coming out, it's that she, too much controversy, was teaching a class at NYU. Now, it became, for some reason, the fact that a couple sort of Twitter famous journalists were, one of the classes was canceled, but not Lauren Duca's, this was all a while ago, um, were teaching these, I guess, like, at least in Lauren Duca's case, some sort of mini class at NYU in journalism. Now. I come at this from the perspective of somebody who my, my doctorate is from NYU, not in journalism, but I actually did have a bunch of courses with people from journalism. So I'm kind of familiar with that realm of things. I've taught at NYU. I've also taught not at NYU. So I have a little inside knowledge, not of that class, but like of the topic itself. And um, it seems like to be hired as a writer to be an, or as anybody to be an adjunct to teach a class is like, it's something that will be understood in the general public as being kind of like anointed, important professor and given a lot of money when in fact it's kind of like a side gig for a writer that's like prestigious, but not like, it doesn't mean Lauren Duke is like in her ivory tower now and mm -hmm. to be there till she retires at age 90, you know, like that's not what it means to be an adjunct of a class. Um, and there was something very misleading early on in this profile um, about the class. It was something like called like a feminist journalist, right? Or something like that. Anyway. So this is a quote from the Buzzfeed article, Buzzfeed profile for Duca. It was, I imagine, exactly what Tucker Carlson would envision a liberal journalism class might be. A bunch of kids from varied backgrounds, ethnicities, orientations, and gender identities who could each afford a sixty or sorry, a six thousand five hundred dollar class wearing t shirts that said gender queer or kill patriarchy. Now, what jumped out about me uh, about me, ugh, yeah, this is all about me. No, what jumped out about this to me is this notion sort of between the lines that like it, it somehow implies that Lauren Duca would have been getting that fee times the number of students in the class, which is so, so far off from the pay for this. So it kind of like the stakes I felt were a little misleading. And she herself, Lauren Duca, wrote some rebuttal to this article where she points out that the pay is low. 
Um, and it also, I think, is misleading about who students are in these cases and kind of suggests that they all, like, that scholarships don't exist and that they would, or loans mm. and, yeah. So that, that already kind of lost me a bit. But then there's more where it really goes, I know, it is. <laughs> no, <laughs> the it, intricacies of academia, I know. No, but we're I, really... I'm really not yeah. yawning because I'm, I'm bored. I'm just yawning because my glasses are giving me a headache. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> well, I have sight privilege, as I might, I might my family's always pointing out to me. So this, I'm, I'm just, sorry. Um, yeah. No, you're very blurry, but I'm going to, I'm going to hang in there like this for a little bit. Well, I'm, you know, um, so, but it's fascinating to hear about this, um, as uh, you know, I don't teach college classes. I don't have a PhD or even a master's degree. Um, so this is an education for me in the, uh, vagaries of, of academia. Well, it's really just about precarious labor really more than even about academia. But I think what's tricky with academia is people assume that somebody teaching a class is not in that realm at all and is in this kind of haughty situation when, in fact, it's like any other, you know, freelance sort of contract work and often pays a lot less than other such work, um, mm. which gets to kind of the crux of it, which is about how the students of this class, so Lauren Duca invited Satchikul to sit in on the last class and ultimately the students of this class all pretty much hated her, their instructor mm. and complained about her and she will never teach again. Right. And in her, in her rebuttal, what was interesting is she kind of addressed this head on. She said, I'm not a good teacher. And now I know that, um, you know, it's, so she had the opportunity to try this, I suppose, which, you know, you could say, well, most people don't even get to find out, most people don't even get to find out that they're bad at teaching by failing at teaching. Um, I think a lot of people do actually find that out <laughs> in one way or another, not necessarily teaching at a college, but I think there are many yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But the thing that kind of jumped out at me about this profile, which, you know, it was supposed to be really about her, it was supposed to be about the book, it's supposed to be about Lauren Duca as a writer, and it really ended up being about how Lauren Duca is kind of a crappy person. Like, that was sort of the, the thematic takeaway there. Mm. Um, what was sort of fascinating to me is this idea that, you know, the, the people who are kind of like your viral heroes, your internet heroes, um, people who manage to leverage particularly the dynamics of Twitter to become very influential and, and very, um, successful and famous that, that anybody is shocked when it turns out that these people are also, you know, self-involved, self-aggrandizing, not exactly good at nurturing the careers or intellectual lives of other people. Like, yeah. I mean, Twitter especially is a medium that rewards like a lot of antisocial impulses, you know, to get to be yeah. a big deal there, you kind of have to be a shitty person. Well, okay. So I'm going to push back on the whole thing about her being a bad teacher, even though I know she herself says that she was. I saw the syllabus because somebody had tweeted it and I saw it that she, for her class. Yeah, it was weird. It was a really weird syllabus. And it has things like, if you don't like it, then just don't take the class. Or it's just like very, very colloquial and long and weird and just doesn't seem professional at all. As she points out in her rebuttal, she did not get advice on this. It's possible that had she wanted to go this route, she could have been with some sort of pointers, a perfectly fine teacher when I first taught a class more than 10 years ago, I'm not sure that I would want a BuzzFeed article about that. You know what I mean? Like, this is mm -hmm. something that takes a lot of time to get better at. And, you know, it's a different skill than like, so with Lauren Duke, in Lauren Duca's case, being kind of like a social media personality um, and, you know, teen Vogue writer. In my case, being like very, like, you know, junior expert on the Dreyfus affair, yeah, very useful for teaching French grammar. I mean, no, you know, you have to have experience at these things. And it seems like she wasn't given pointers, had one chance, and it didn't go well. Um, and I, I mean, this whole notion of her being, I feel like the, I don't know that it's about whether or not she's a shitty person as, so this is what really, the, the passage from the profile that really, 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 I can't stop thinking about is, um, 
comparing her to Malala, okay, saying that she, at 22, has a Nobel Peace Prize. Is Duke, and this is still this quote, is Duca the best person suited to speak to Gen Z when Gen Z is already rallying its own peers? And it's like, oh, come on. Lauren Duca is fine. She's not Malala. Is she pretending she is? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, this just, the, the bar is just too high. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, right. she's not a saint, but did she say she was? Yeah, everybody who's not a Nobel Peace Prize winner who was, you know, shot in the head as a child, um, exactly. just, you know, just give up, stop working. <laughs> well, exactly. And it's trying like, to contribute anything to the discourse. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, obviously more sympathetic. an impossible bar, It's that clear. type of profile, um, as Kat has written about this type of profile um, in a different context, but where, where the... Um, the person profiled the the argument of the profile is that the person is an asshole and it just leaves the reader more sympathetic to the person because um the, the bar is too high and it's too much about like yeah so i think my theory here is that part of what's entering into this is this notion that lauren duca has been too successful and that it's unfair um and that the reader and writer are supposed to be kind of nodding to each other um, about this dr- sort of devastating unfairness. And well, I don't know, is, is that really the tragedy of our times that Lauren Duca has maybe been like slightly more successful than merited? Yeah. You know, it's, it's true that like I did come away from this profile feeling, you know, sympathetic towards her, um, which is interesting because she says a lot of stuff, even in the context of the profile, that I found really obnoxious. Um, and the, I don't know, there's, there's a certain, I mean, her Twitter persona also is not, is not my favorite thing. Um, but it's bizarre how she is, like she clearly perceived throughout her conversations with this reporter that this this was not going to be a friendly piece, um, that there was going to be an angle on it that was deeply unflattering to her. And she alerted the reporter during their conversations to the fact that, that she had figured this out. Um, and it's her quotes from these exchanges are presented like, look how paranoid Lauren yeah. Duca was that she thought I was out to get her, but she, but you were out to get her like this, you know, that's exactly oh, yeah. what this piece was. It was a, it was a takedown. Oh, um, yeah. The idea that, you know, that we should kind of like make fun of her um, or mock her for having accurately perceived what the nature of these exchanges actually was like that, yeah. that does seem a little bit bizarre to me. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what, what seemed, so this really to basically like, Normally, when you see an article that's like making fun of some college class and being like, oh, the instructor is such an idiot. And like, look what's going on at the university, at at these, you know, universities today, ha ha ha, whatever. It's kind of a from the right critique. And what's, and here's like an adjunct was disliked by the students the administration is already on the case. It's not like journalists need to save the day. No, the administration already knows and they're dealing with it. Um, it seems kind of like not very like good progressive behavior to be like so crappy to the instructor. But then it also, in turn, I started to feel very bad for like apparently one student in the class, like one student in the class was having problems to do with language. And then like, it becomes this whole big discussion. Then also in Lauren Duca's rebuttal, where she's saying like, no, this was actually just a bad student. And it's like, why is this even like public knowledge to begin with? It just like something about it seemed like, like, I find it off putting when sort of from the right critiques of academia turn the classroom into like, for public dissection. And this, I don't think it's like any more appealing from the left. And if anything seems somehow more hypocritical, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I say give Lauren Duke another chance to teach a class and maybe, maybe that'll be the one. (laughs) I don't know. I'm not going to be taking it. So it's not my problem. No, I I think in time she could potentially, who knows, anything's possible, but um if she wants to, and it doesn't sound if like she, she really does. No, I think she'll be fine without it. I don't think she, yeah, who knows? Who knows? But, um, but yeah, 
Do you have more on that article? Um, I, you know, for a second, there was a thought in my head and it flew completely away. So completely that I have no idea what it was. So let's, Maybe. It might come back. Come back. <laughs> yes. So moving from um, teen Vogue to grown-up Vogue. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is a, a fine, I'm happy with this transition. Yeah, transition. that's a good one. Um, so something has happened recently where publications associated with either sort of lad culture or high fashion or any number of things that are not particularly one searches for a word that isn't woke, but enlightened, whatever of the moment, social justice are now producing the same sort of think pieces, template, such and such could cause offense. That's very like problematic type template articles, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Ugh, I'm not very articulate about this, but you know what I mean? Like the sort of, this is problematic format articles, op-eds yes. with that argument appear now everywhere, including from publications where um, that would not be so expected. So Teen Vogue and also regular Vogue. Um, I feel like it's everywhere now. It's in Cosmopolitan. It's, oh, yeah. It's in, I think it's in L and Bazaar and everything. It's in everything, mm -hmm. um, which I think also has this impact of changing expectations of what these publications will have in them and the same publications, I guess I just, what I'm really struck by is that the same publications where, as I remember them as physical magazines, like from my youth, would be like, of course, the only people worthy of looking at are like rich white supermodels, you know, who are you know, like either it would either be socialites or supermodels or often some sort of like maybe crossover type thing. Although I guess that's newer that that's mm -hmm. such a crossover. But um, now it's like they're taking a very different tack. And when they kind of um, dip a toe into sort of the old, like people are shocked that something in vogue could be problematic. Yeah. You know, what's funny to me is my, my theory on this is that this is basically what glossy women's magazines have always done. Um, you know, the, the, they've always been about preying on women's insecurities to, mm -hmm. you know, to either have them buy stuff or to keep them reading or, or both. Um, it's just that it's no longer trendy to shame you for your body or your bad skin or your shitty hair. Um, but it's, they're still in the business of making us feel bad about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so now your problem areas are that, you know, are like your problematic areas instead. Ooh, I um, like it. I like it. Um, <laughs> right. That's fantastic. But it's so, but it's so superficial. Um, oh yeah. Too, it's to because, avoid having the economic critique, right? I right. mean, isn't that the whole idea that it's to just do the trappings and not. Yeah. It's yeah. Emily, it's Emily Ratajkowski in an armpit market. <laughs> it is. Oh, oh, it's so, oh, so we have three subtopics for this section and I do not know which to begin with because they are all very apropos. Um, do you have a preference between the, of the three that we have here? We have, um, I don't want to list them all. I want some surprises, but. Well, you know, since, um, since we're talking about Vogue and since I wanted to put a pin in this topic earlier, let's segue into the Rihanna. Yes. Let's yeah. do that. Okay. Um, Explain so, that. yeah. And this kind of, it's interesting because this also circles back to the Lauren Duca piece. And the one we talked about even prior to that, um, where there's this element of, you know, criticizing a writer for being privileged and so on. But just to quickly recap what yes. I'm talking about yes. before I talk about it. So Rihanna, um, who is this, this Rihanna person? Rihanna, um, you know, on the cover of Vogue, yes. which is a big, exciting deal to begin with. Um, she it, was uh, a pop star and also a makeup um, entrepreneur. Who and fa and fashion. Does anybody yeah. not know who Rihanna is? I was just, I, I don't oh. know if our <laughs> audience knows who she is, but, they have to. They I have feel, to. I feel That's like the they thing. must. You know, she was her saturation. I think, our, I think we will have a comment of who is that <laughs> from somebody who's making a point. Maybe. 
maybe, but, but, they, but they, they would have, know. they would have some nerve. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so she's on the cover and as is, you know, per Vogue tradition, in addition to her photo shoot, she's profiled by a writer, uh, named Abby Aguirre. I'm not, that seems possible. not sure how to pronounce her last name. It Aguirre. might be, a, I think Aguirre. 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 But I think so, um, but I'm not. Yeah, sorry. I've only read it. I have not heard it pronounced. A G U I R R E. Um, so in her profile, she mentions up front that when she arrived for this interview, um, which had been rescheduled several times um, and, and rescheduled earlier each time to the point where she was arriving to this interview with basically no notice, um, that she did not have a list of questions prepared. And so when she sat down with Rihanna, she said, you know, I didn't have a chance to prepare a list of questions for this interview, so I'm winging it. You've got to help me out here. Mm-hmm. Um, and boy, did Twitter get upset about this. Um, Rihanna's scary fans, uh, known as the Navy, particularly were upset. But also fellow journalists um, went just kind of bonkers on this writer, you know, saying that this was, you know, the disrespect, the height of privilege to show up to an interview with Rihanna, which is at least as good as, if not better than meeting Jesus Christ himself. Like, how could you do this? Um, you know, how could you, and how could you admit it in print? And how could your editors let it through? Like, um, so there was this, I mean, there's a lot going on here, but one of the things that was interesting to me about it is the, instant idea that there was racial subtext to this um that like uh you know a a black woman writer who you know would never be given this opportunity to begin with and if she had been she would never have the nerve to show up unprepared um you know or to or to admit it in print or to admit it to rihanna and that um is like something I, I've been thinking about for the past 24 hours um, that I, I just want to kind of just flat out disagree that, that there's actually this, you know, a black woman would never element oh. here. Well, I think what something that really struck me about the Twitter hubbub about this is that a, a ringleader of it seemed to be an account of a white woman who has something like 90 something followers a white woman avatar identifying, I think herself as a white woman, but fine, but very outraged on behalf of all the black women who might be outraged about this. Some were, but it also just seemed like she was kind of stirring things up, which I think is an angle that often comes up in these sorts of Twitter oh, yes. controversies. Um, yeah. It seemed like a very straightforward case of like, if your teacher moves a math test up and you haven't studied you know, like the notion that everybody would just sit around with a list of questions ready for the profile that they think is happening on a different day. I mean, presumably she has other responsibilities yeah, at her she job. Has other work I do. think what it did, the reason the reason this was presented in this way has to do partly with this notion of like fandom that she would be putting that first. Yeah. Because she's a big fan, which um as if as if that would be the main thing, whereas maybe her boss needed something from her sooner. You know what I mean? Yeah. I picture like I mean, obviously I'm picturing Devil Wears Prada, right? Anna Wintour, right. But yeah, I mean, if she's a freelancer, and I think I think she may be. Um, I think these these Vogue um, profiles are often written by non staff oh. writers um, who freelance for other places. Oh, I, I could be mistaken on that, um, but. Oh God, there's so much going on here. Um, so like for one thing, you know, if, uh, under similar circumstances, you know, if, um, you know, all other things being equal, if this were a woman who was also black and was profiling, uh, profiling Rihanna and she received a phone call, you know, telling her that she had an hour's notice now to, you know, to get to this hotel and interview her subject, this interview that she thought originally was happening. At first she thought it was happening the next day. And then she thought it was happening in the evening. And now it's happening like in 10 minutes. Um, The idea that, you know, 
that, that she would have, I don't know, like built a time machine to, you know, to, to somehow go back and be prepared for this. I mean, obviously that wouldn't happen, but more than that, um, all, all things being equal, if this woman is good at her job and when she arrives, um, to sit down to have this conversation, she, she does exactly what this writer did, which is to, you know, to make yourself vulnerable in a way that invites a rapport, invites your subject mm-hmm. to want to, to help you out, basically. Um, and, and of course she's going to want to because like Rihanna is the reason why you're unprepared. Like she, you know, she's the one who's been adjusting and adjusting the schedule here. Like she, she knows that she was there for it. Mm-hmm. So, um, the idea that it's, you know, that it's disrespectful or that it's, that it's unprofessional rather than like prostrating yourself and being obsequious, um, to this superstar that you're interviewing to actually do your job and mm. find a way to form a rapport with her. Like, I just, I want to yeah. just like strenuously disagree with that as a person who sometimes interviews celebrities myself. Um, you know, you can't fawn, all over them. Um, you know, you're not, uh, I mean, apart from the fact that it's not appropriate to approach these conversations as a fan, you're not going to get a good interview that way. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think there's also some sort of, I feel like there's a connection with the Lauren Dupa thing in terms of this, like being so fixated on the kind of opportunity aspect as to kind of miss the bigger picture of like, sort of being really like, punching arguably down on either an adjunct or a journalist in these cases, who's like, you know, trying to do their job and being like, like, let's have the whole public assess how their job is going. Hmm. You know? And it's yeah. like, that part doesn't quite um, sit right. I mean, I think it's also just like I, what I noticed though, with the, with the Rihanna thing that seemed different from maybe like some of the, publishing stories is this notion that like of all the people that like so many people would have wanted to interview her it's like well so many people would have wanted to meet her I I'm not a celebrity interviewing journalist I don't feel like I'm in the you know there are celebrities I like I don't know that that's really like that's not I have not written I've written profiles but not like celebrity Mm -hmm. no you know like this notion that everybody who wants to meet Rihanna also is like a contender for this position to profile her for Vogue sort of seems like a bit of a misunderstanding of like, I feel like it's, these were almost two different kind of interlinked conversations. Like everybody who wanted the opportunity didn't necessarily want it professionally. A lot of people just wanted to meet her, which, you know, a very famous person. I mean, this is an area where the writer herself didn't do herself any favors and I think screwed up her response um, because she's on Twitter. She's like, look, nobody has more reverence for Rihanna than I do. And it's like, that's, that's not the point. You know, the, no. it's not your job to be reverent. It's your job to have a conversation that's interesting and to get good answers out of her. So um, yeah, the idea that, you know, that, that an interview is something that you're granted as a reward for being the utmost fan of, you know, whomever it is that you're profiling is just doesn't, that's not how it works. I mean, I think it's frustrating because I think there are plenty of valid examples of black women being denigrated in the culture, not respected. I think that that, I don't think that's like something people are hallucinating. I think the problem is in this very specific case, the interview was moved up it's understandable that somebody freelancer or staff would have been, you know, less prepared than ideal. And to sort of not everything fits, not everything, the bigger picture story can be true without every little picture story sort of serving that argument as it were. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was fascinated to see how many people accused this writer of, of having failed to prepare for her interview um, because she was racist towards Rihanna. Um, and it's, it's just kind of funny because I feel like in this, especially in the context of this situation, if anybody abused their privilege, it's the, you know, massive pop star gajillionaire celebrity who, you know, kept arbitrarily changing the schedule for this interview, knowing that, you know, whatever she asked for, they were going to scramble to make it happen. 
Um, which is not to say that like I'm dissing Rihanna. I don't want her fans to come after me. Um, but you know, the, the idea that the kind of racial identity categories trump something as, as massive as celebrity status and immense wealth in this case, um, was, kind of a weird thing to me. Well, what I want to bring it back to is this notion of these publications themselves. And I think this has, I think there's a lot of, I feel like everybody's angry about the right things sometimes, but at the wrong targets. Like Vogue and publications like it are very responsible for propagating all sorts of, you know, not so fantastic beauty standards for years, you know, for years. And, you know, and just generally being about venerating socialites and people for pretty much being like rich, white, thin, whatever, you know, these things. And it seems like to nitpick that this, this one journalist who did not have time to have questions for reasons that weren't even her fault. You know, it just, it seems like, I don't know. I feel like there's just something strange about it of all the things to be angry about at Vogue about this seems so like odd to me I think is sort of some of it like it's Vogue like that's the thing you're gonna I don't know I it's not it's not that I don't think people should be allowed to be annoyed about small things but it's like Vogue like how what were you (laughs) expecting from Vogue it's Vogue it's like I don't know I guess maybe maybe that's me um being dated about this but do you do you think we can move on to our next Vogue related Thing. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Vogue, what is Vogue these days? Well, I, apart from when getting my hair de-oranged, which it's a little less orange than it was, um, I do not generally pick up physical copies of fashion magazines these days, but I do like everybody, you know, read the things that are linked to on the social medias. And um, there was one, was an article in Vogue called why I won't be seeing the new Joker movie. <laughs> well, on Vogue.com, I guess. So Vogue, like Teen Vogue, like apparently every single outlet, has just the, it, it sort of churns out these think pieces. Now, I have a conspiracy theory about this particular one, which is that it's cheaper for Vogue to run that than to send somebody to actually see it and review it. Um. That is an interesting idea, and it's not wrong. Um, I mean, it's, this is a problem overall with sort of the decline of reported pieces. You know, all people want is takes, um, and there's more of an incentive, too, for journalists to do stuff like this, like to go see the Joker movie yes. and then write a, a thoughtful review of it. Um First, you have to sit through the movie for two mm-hmm. hours, and then you have to write your review. Whereas Absolutely. if you're just going to write sight unseen about why you haven't seen it, you know, like, yeah, this is actually just a more efficient use of your time, you know, monetarily Indeed. speaking, um, to, even if you're getting the same amount. Very true. Money. Very true. I think this is something people don't necessarily understand about um, freelance writing. But if you want your fee to add up to even minimum wage... And you have the option of reporting something, really researching it, you know, reviewing something that you've actually looked at, or being like, this is problematic, here are three links to some angry tweets, blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily that you think, objectively, journalism linking to three tweets is better. In fact, you probably don't. But if you're going to be making, I don't know what they pay per post on Vogue.com, but whatever, yeah, you probably are making a rational decision. Um, And then of course people are going to see this and like, Oh, look at the outrage, you know, it's like, yeah, it is. It's, it's something structural about journalism that encourages this for sure. And on the left and the right, you know, there's right wing Mm -hmm. versions of this um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a struggle, you know, as a journalist, if, you know, if you, take your job seriously and you want to produce pieces that have more integrity. um, It's, it's really like a trade-off, you know, to, to spend, you know, a a week, you know, hours and hours of time reporting a piece so that you can write something careful and well-informed, but that probably isn't going to get even as much traffic um, as the outraged think piece that you could dash off in half an hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And then also just in terms of, 
volume that's now expected. Like um, if you have to write many, 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 like I, I'm tempted to do the articles, you know, <laughs> per week, like at a certain threshold, these are no longer articles and these are, you know, turned out takes. There's nothing you can do. It doesn't have anything to do with what could be done. It's just like what's being paid for. Um, but though, but then the, the reality though, like separating us from the sort of journalist um, inside business angle is there is something that's happened where like everything has to be sort of put through this, um, te- put into this like social justice think piece template. And where I thought that was the most surprising lately um, was the Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition is very, has become feminist. Yes. Yes, it has. They even, um, I think, included a, a model in a burkini in their last... Oh, I hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen that. This is... So um, somebody linked to a very um, a funny tweet from the Sports Illustrated swimsuit thing about um, that quoted the article in question. Um, and I'm trying to find where, cause this was like really, really, really funny. Um, yeah. Something like a woman can be intelligent and sexy. So it's an article by the tweet links to an article by a swimsuit model, um, Haley Khalil, um, who writes in this article, growing up in a typical Minnesota family, you don't spend too much time thinking about your seemingly impossible dream of becoming an SI swimsuit model. The illustrious world of exotic places, red carpets, and high fashion photo shoots seems unreachable. And I'm thinking this thinking like, I grew up in New York City. I wasn't going to be any swimsuit model. You know, most people aren't going to be any swimsuit model. It has to do with what you look like in a bathing suit. And a very few people look swimsuit model in a bathing suit and they have the option if they so choose to be swimsuit models. But what was so funny about this piece is that, so literally if you click on it and I'm sure some of our viewers will do this now that I mentioned this, you get this, like, it's not just that you see pictures of this woman in a swimsuit, but I'm looking at it now and it's like, she's writhing. Writhing. (laughs) Yes. I'm looking at it too. (laughs) And it's like, I'm sure <laughs> nobody's watching us anymore, Kat. They are all <laughs> watching this woman just writhing. Writhing bare ass in the sand. I could I could tell you all my social security number right now and it wouldn't matter. You'd be like <laughs> And underneath it, I just have to say, um, it says Sports Illustrated swimsuit is a bold depiction of strong, unapologetic women embracing their truths right below this video of this woman embracing something, but it's her naked breasts. Oh, um, it's amazing. <laughs> the, whole, the whole pretense of it. Um, okay. And then, like, here's a quote from the article. Sports Illustrated Swimsuit was the first major fashion publication to humanize the model. Oh. <laughs> it's like, what? Because, like, they gave they, that it's just um, to human. I mean, they showed more of her human body and possibly I mean, even it's just her- this whole thing. This, this whole thing. A woman can be intelligent and sexy. She can be an academic and a sports illustrated swimsuit model. It's like, well, yeah, can, I mean, can an academic or anybody who's just not a swimsuit model be a swimsuit model? Well, no, not really. Um, she can graduate summa cum laude and still embrace her body in a tiny bikini. The former does not negate the latter, and I hope to encourage women to pursue their passions despite social constructs. And this is like... It's, tree, yeah, it's, I guess it's what, social constructs that are keeping me from being a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. Same. Maybe. I mean, the social construct of what it means to, you know, that's a poodle in the bedroom. Um, the social, social constructs that are keeping her from being a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model as well. She was once in some Chanel thing, my dog, but that's another story for another wow. time. I don't think it ever ended up running, but it was for Italian Vanity Fair. She was scouted. I know, but my dog, yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's like this weird thing that also came up with Emily Rajkowski with the like notion that like, what ju- it's just so funny because it's the don't hate me because I'm beautiful framed now repackaged as this feminist cause where it's like, it's kind of, oh, we have come full circle. It's like, it's kind of like the don't hate me because I care about 
boots and fashion, don't think that I couldn't be serious. But here it's like, don't think that I'm not serious because I'm a bikini model is like, is that feminism? Is it just, can't it just be like, like, can't you just not think she's non, can't you just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I find this breed of, um, you know, kind of objectification, I guess, so much more noxious than just like what the swimsuit edition used to be or, or like traditional playboy, just, you know, just, yeah. just like, let's, let's stop pretending that it's something it's not. Um, exactly. I mean, this whole, oh, it's a beautiful body in a bikini, like, and that's fine. Right. Um, the idea that we have to pretend that it's also like, this super duper feminist statement to be like writhing nude in the waves, um, you know, yeah. like, like brandishing your wearing a bikini made of your PhD. I don't know. It's, you know, it's, that's definitely what I've done with mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, it's definitely a string bikini now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing though. I mean, like, it's worse. It's something happens where you have to like, I guess to kind of come full circle, some of this where you have to not just like be okay with like Vogue, whatever swimsuits, whatever it's all out there. It's sometimes nice to look at, sometimes nice to be annoyed at. You can have whatever feelings about it, but you have to like suddenly, I guess people talk about like woke capitalism. Maybe it's that, but it's just like, but it's like, but woke suggests something to do with like race and it's more sort of about feminism in this case but it's like why does it have to why did who like I resent not the existence of the swimsuit stuff but the the notion that I'm supposed to like that my feminism is supposed to be like respecting the feminism of that and it's just kind of like can I just be like that exists fine like yeah I too I I too am annoyed by that and well we'll start the I hashtag I too yeah, <laughs> about this, I think. <laughs> I, about, I, I too reject this as you know a main a main tenet or a tenet at all of feminism. Yeah, agreed. Agree to agree. Agree to, <laughs> agree to woof. Agree um, to, oh, yeah. They're coming back in. My family is coming back in. So, so this I, is a perfect moment. Yes. To say that this has been feminine chaos. It certainly has. Please and, join uh, us on Patreon. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye.